here. So this is a, a guy named Robbie Michnik. He's one of BlackRock's main guys in terms of the Bitcoin scene. If you listened, I've listened to several interviews with this guy, and he's he's talked about the fact that BlackRock didn't just get into Bitcoin this year. They've been building a team for the last 10 years ish. And this guy's been a big part of it. And so we're at the point now, it's the public facing part where BlackRock's out there, they're in support of Bitcoin. But there was a time between BlackRock getting into Bitcoin, hiring a team of advisors and experts. On that day, between then and the ETF launch, Larry Fink had been saying some very negative things about Bitcoin for obvious reasons. You don't tell people that you're going to buy Bitcoin before you buy it. You buy it first and then tell people to buy it. Just common sense. So these guys have been working on the Bitcoin side of things at ETF at BlackRock, preparing for this ETF launch for many, many years now. And this guy has been a big part of it. So I would recommend if you have any time today or this week, just type in Robbie Michnik and look at some of his interviews at like Bitcoin conference at uh, what's it? What's the Baltic Honey Badger? I think he was there too. Very, very interesting stuff though in terms of BlackRock's perspective on this so let's listen this is him on where bloomberg crypto Let's see what he has to say on crypto <laughs> fucking dummies oh what happened here hey quick shout out to foundation there might be doing some work with them as well in the near future how hard is the sell when you think about the retail investor base that can get into this? If you're trying to tell them it's digital gold, that the volatility is still so high and many people don't understand exactly what it is at the end of the day. Is it something that will eventually be used as more um, payment methods moving forward across different parts of the world? Is it something that you hold and never sell, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you then make that case to a generation of people who have not gotten into this asset? Sure. Well, when you think about Bitcoin, we think of it primarily as an emerging global monetary alternative, right? It is a scarce, global, decentralized, uh, non-sovereign asset. And it is an asset which has no country-specific risk, has no traditional counterparty risk. So these are interesting properties when you think of it from a uh, non-sovereign asset. And it is an asset which has no country-specific risk, has no traditional counterparty risk. So these are interesting properties when you think of it from an investment perspective, particularly in a world where there's growing concerns over uh, you know, money printing, currency debasement risks, political, fiscal uh, sustainability challenges in, in the US or, or elsewhere. And so that resonates, frankly, with a lot of investors. It goes back to what we talked about earlier with the risk on piece. It confuses investors when people talk about it as risk on because based on the properties that I just described, you would think of it as risk off. And that's where I think- It has some a marketing the, problem. So it, <laughs> you could say that. And so, you know, the reality is there's probably two or three things a year that happen typically that actually impact the fundamental value of Bitcoin. This year, I would argue there's been four, but that makes it hard to write daily stories, right? And so you see this uh, instinct to kind of point to whatever's happening in equities or unemployment or jobs numbers or manufacturing, which really has no connection to Bitcoin. Less is more is moving to the moon. <laughs> it's, it's a great call. I'm look. I'm just looking at Bitcoin BTC backpacker. I've been hearing a lot of good things about Coinos lately, from several people in the living in the future community. Coinos, take a look at that one. I downloaded it, but I haven't used it yet. Coinos.io. I think that they're also going to be implementing eCash into theirs. All right. I'm going to send 88 sats here to our buddy BTC backpacker for uh, his comment today. So it's a new thing we're trying on the show. So here we go. BTC backpacker at coinos.io, 88 sats. Try telling me Bitcoin isn't cool. All right. 
back to what we were talking about here. So did you hear him say there, what did he say? Let me try to rewind this again. He said there's no country specific risk to Bitcoin. No country specific risk. Decentralized uh, non-sovereign asset. And it is an asset which has no country specific risk, has no traditional counterparty risk. So these are interesting properties when you think. Those are very interesting properties. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give a bit of a I'm going to give a bit of a background here in terms of why I came up with not came up with this, but why I started thinking about this. And and I've had some time to process everything in the last couple of months, I'd say. And so I'm going to be talking about why Bitcoin is early Manhattan and actually why Bitcoin is much better than early Manhattan. So before we get into it, I just want to, again, early start of the show, I would suggest if you're watching this clip right now, I would go back and watch the entire show today because we're, this is at minute 52 right now. And we've been kind of talking about this throughout the whole show today. So if you're watching this clip later, make sure you go check out the show. It's called Bitcoin is Early Manhattan for the full effect here. But as I said, the kind of the idea of why I want to talk about this today and highlight this is because I want people to really start thinking about Bitcoin long term, like 100 years out. Even though you might think we won't be here, we might be, but we probably won't be, but we might be. But 100 years out from now, and not for yourself, not something you're going to buy and you're going you're gonna to make 100% return on, sell it and take a trip to Vegas. That's not what Bitcoin is about. And I know people like to think about Lambos and new houses and all these different things. But I think for most people, they want to invest their money into something that they can turn around, cash out and buy something that they think makes them happy. But I really want to switch people's perspective here because if, if you compare it to early Manhattan, let's say that you were fortunate enough to be part of that back in when, I don't even know what year it was, 1700s? I don't know, maybe earlier than that. Well, let's say you were somebody who was fortunate enough to get land at that time in Manhattan. And you think about that, say there was like 100, 200, 300 people who were able to get into, to see the vision, to see what, what was coming there, to buy land, to start developing that land. And you think about of those 300 people, how many people do you think, how many families do you think today still have that property in their name? Out of 300, maybe five, maybe 10. And think about all the people who dropped off before that because they couldn't see that far into the future they couldn't see the full vision and how this whole thing would play out and how much that would impact their family in the future so people let's say they bought uh, a couple what would it be at the time uh sections of land in manhattan and maybe they paid five bucks for it for a section of land and some people after a year as more and more people started coming to manhattan all of a sudden they got it valued for $10 and they thought, well, I made, I doubled my money here. I'd be crazy not to cash out. So they sold their section of land for in early Manhattan for $10, even though they came out ahead, but they probably bought, I don't know, a new horse with that, with the proceeds or a couple horses compared to the people who still today own land <clears throat> in Manhattan and are still seeing the dividends paid off from, from their family just hodling. And so keep that in mind here. And the one thing that I was talking about in terms of letting this sink in, I went to Italy in June, July, whenever it was. Went to Italy for a wedding. And the wedding was the most insane thing that I've ever seen and probably the most, I shouldn't say that I'll ever see, but might ever see. It was uh, the family, I won't give away any names, I'm not gonna dox anybody or even close to that, but the family who was putting on the wedding or hosting the wedding, they had land in Manhattan or New York from many years ago. Their great, great grandpa had land in New York and it's made it, the family still holds the, the property there and the wedding that they were able to pay for, we're, we're not talking millions here, we're talking above that, right? 
So there's the difference between myself and a millionaire, and there's a difference between a millionaire and on top of that. So this wedding was absolutely insane. And I haven't talked about it on the show because it was still kind of fresh in my mind. And I, you know, I didn't really want know if I wanted to talk about it too much on here. But the only thing I'll say is that this is the kind of wedding that it was. On Friday night, the wedding was Saturday. On Friday night, there was a surprise act, surprise DJ showed up for the wedding. The chain smokers. So that's how much money we're talking here. But it's important to note, and why I wanted to talk about this is the the, the family didn't come out with a new cure for cancer. They didn't come out with a new iPhone. They didn't come out with any sort of invention or idea or technology that got them that money. All they did was they were fortunate enough to be at the right place at the right time. And their family managed to hold on to it. That's the key. The family managed to hold on to it for the next hundred years or however long they've had it. You know, I said that there was 300 people early Manhattan. I think that maybe one of those people might have it at this time or less. Think about how many times it's changed hands. So that's kind of one of what I wanted to point out is the fact that they didn't do anything special. They didn't invent anything. They didn't form any Teslas or send anything to the moon. All they did is they were in the right place at the right time. And I'm not saying it was easy because if you think about how many people do not have that land that they did back then because they got greedy, they made poor decisions, whatever that is. I'm not saying that that's easy. Holding on to an asset when it's you see it keep going up and up and up and wanting to convert that into something that you can see short term, get, get that that hit of, of something in the short term to think about something that far into the future is very difficult. I would argue that it's probably more difficult than coming up with a new idea or something that changed the world truly. So that's, that's kind of the main point that I wanted to talk about in terms of how Bitcoin is early Manhattan. I'm going to talk about a few more things here in terms of why I think it's better than land in early Manhattan. And maybe we'll start with the fact that as he just talked about there, as he just talked about there, there's no country specific risk to Bitcoin. So let's say in a different world, you know, things maybe went differently for this family. Maybe New York decided that, you know, they're going to separate from the US. They're going to go to war. They're going to take everybody's property. They're going to fund the war with that. And maybe they would have lost their apartments back then. That could have happened. It's happened in many parts of the world. And so when you're investing in real estate, you always have to worry about your not only your local area, but also the country and, and the risks that come with that. So here in Canada, I would say that owning property is a significant, I shouldn't say significant, but based on the last nine years of our government and what they've been doing to our citizens, I would say that owning property in Canada is fairly risky right now. So with Bitcoin, you don't have that country specific risk. And I think the reason why Manhattan, obviously, you consider why it's gone up in value outside of like the fiat dollar debasing. But you think about why it's become so popular is because it's a very desired area of the world. And up until about four years ago, it was just going up and up and up. But then you have something like the pandemic, where all of a sudden, this highly desirable land, these highly desirable apartments Maybe they're not quite as desirable anymore. Maybe people aren't working in New York City anymore. Maybe they moved out of the city because the government there has done such a poor job of governance that people are leaving the city. So that's the risk that you face, that the governments in your area, in your country, if they if they make stupid decisions, they do bad things, the demand goes down for your property. And I'm sure if you looked at the property values in Manhattan over the last 10 years and compared them, I'm guessing they're going down right now because people are moving out of the cities, because the government's fucked up so badly that people want to leave New York City. So with Bitcoin, you don't have that risk. You don't have to worry about what your dictator says in Ottawa or your mayor says in New York City. You don't have to worry about that. There's no country specific risk to Bitcoin. 
So there's no the risk of NYC and there's no risk of USA. Both those are something that you have to consider your city, your state and your country. There's risks to owning property like Manhattan real estate from all those three things. The other thing too is property tax. Property tax, you don't have to pay any property tax with Bitcoin. Imagine how much it costs to, so here's what we have to think about because there are good things about owning real estate too. And we have to keep that in mind. We can't just be one-sided here because with, with real estate in Manhattan, what they would have done there is they maybe bought an apartment block 500 years ago, 300, whatever it was. Uh, and they've been renting it out. They've been renting it out to individuals. They've been renting it out to companies. That's their income being generated. That's the beauty of real estate is if you get in at the right time, it's in a higher, a very highly desirable area. You can charge people rent on top of that and you earn a return, annual return. You don't get that with Bitcoin. But you also have to, you have to factor in that with renting out to people with renting out to companies, you're taking on a counterparty risk there. You're assuming that they're going to be there. You're assuming that they're going to pay their rent. You're assuming that they're not going to squat on your property and utilize the horrific laws that have been put in place by the government to protect tenants over landlords. You're going to assume all those things. Those are your counterparty risks that you're taking on to earn that yield. And so even though you can't rent out your Bitcoin yet, I think that as Sailor talked about, you're going to be able to. So think about the annual return of real estate for the most part. I mean, Manhattan's probably a little bit higher than most. Maybe not though. But let's say it's 10% annually. With Bitcoin, if you want to take on the same kind of counterparty risk, if you want to, you can rent out your Bitcoin to the bank. You can lend them your Bitcoin and they can pay you a yield on that right? That's the two comparisons there. Both are earning yield. Both are taking on a risk. One's just a little bit more obvious than the other, but that's at the end of the day, that's where you're getting to. So if you strip that back and you say, okay, well, I want to own this apartment building in Manhattan, but I don't want to take on any risk. Just like if you'd be holding your Bitcoin in cold storage and not lending it to the banks. I don't want to take any risk on so with your property, it's probably going to go up in value if it's in a desirable area. If fiat continues to debase, it's probably going to go up in value, right? But you're not going to be able to earn that rent if you're not willing to take on the counterparty risk. So it's very important there. I think that you have to understand that. The, that's where the counterparty risk lies, is that, yes, you are earning a yield, you're renting it out, but you're taking risk with that. You could rent out your Bitcoin to the banks earn a yield on that, but you're taking risk on that. So if you strip away the risk and you say, okay, I'm going to buy this property. I'm just going to let the value do what it does in, in Manhattan. I'm not going to rent it out. Okay. That's great. But is the value increase going to keep up with your property tax, your insurance on the building, all these different things that come up throughout the years, it's going to eat into your value increase, right? So if you strip it back and say, I don't want to take any risk, then yes, in theory, in where we are today, it makes sense to rent out your place. But if you don't want to take on that risk, you're going to be losing money every year on property tax, on insurance. So with Bitcoin, you don't have that. Same, It's the same kind of thing. If you don't want any risk involved with your Bitcoin, you just hold it. But you don't pay property tax. You don't pay insurance. You don't pay a management fee. So that's the second one, property tax. And the third one that's very interesting to me and why I think Bitcoin will be much bigger than land in Manhattan is because of the ability to fractionalize it. So if, sorry, <laughs> wow, BTC Backpacker, you got some really good free advertising there on your address. <laughs> I didn't realize that was still up. But let's say that Jason, Jason has some free cash flow kicking around. He wants to invest a little bit. And so for most people, you can't really go to New York, unless you're Donald Trump, and say, all right, I got some money. I want to buy some land here. For most people, it's impossible to do that, right? 
even back in the day, there was probably a very, a very small amount of people who could take advantage of what's coming there. Even if they had the vision, even if they had the foresight to say, in a in a hundred years from now, this land is going to be worth a hundred x what it is today. I want in on it. Most people can't afford it. They can't afford to buy a full building. But with Bitcoin, I look like a ghost. I don't know. I just noticed that right now. But with Bitcoin, you don't have to. You don't have to buy the whole thing. You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You don't have to buy the whole apartment block. You can buy a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. And even though you might not see the gains of somebody who has a full apartment block, you might have a toilet, the value of the toilet in one of these properties. And so that's the beauty of it. And, and the reason why that's important is because it's going to open up to a lot more people. A lot more people are going to be able to invest in that real estate and that property. And that's going to drive up the prices of it and the value of it. Sorry. So the ability to fractionalize, not only is it going to let in people like us into the the gains that are coming in this, but it's also going to create a lot more demand for this property. So the fractionalization of it is, is huge. The fact that you can take any amount of money and buy any amount of Bitcoin without being an accredited investor, without having a dad who was a, a real estate mogul, you don't need to do that. You can own a piece of this with whatever you have. It's fractionalized. You can own a window in Manhattan, but better. And the last one here is that uh, with the with the land, with the real estate in Manhattan, you have a very limited market, limited demand. So if something like COVID comes around and everybody leaves the city and all of a sudden you're stuck on this $5 million apartment building and nobody wants to buy it, you're limited, you're landlocked. You're limited to only people who want to live in New York City, who want to pay that much for their mortgage or for the rent. That's a very small amount of people that you're limited to selling it to. With Bitcoin, on the other hand, you have an entire planet. Every person in the world can buy Bitcoin, is going to want Bitcoin. So if you want to sell it, if something comes up and you're forced to sell it, you don't need to decrease the value of it. You don't have to go out of your way to find buyers. In five minutes, if you want to sell that asset, somebody is going to be wanting to buy it from you. So that's that's kind of my, my reasons for Bitcoin being better than early Manhattan. But the key thing there is you have to hold through it all. If you want to see this thing through, if, if you want to turn around in a year or two and flip it for a profit, you can do that. But in 100 years from now, your family's going to be like, what the fuck was Jor doing? He was he was alive in 2024 when Bitcoin was around. And what did he He sold it to buy a car? So you got no country specific risk, no state specific risk, no county or municipality risk. No property tax. No fees. If you don't want the risk, you don't have to pay any fees for it. You own it. The fractionalization of it. You don't need to buy a whole apartment building there. You can buy a window of an apartment. And the limited market with, with the real estate in Manhattan, you're very limited to somebody wanting to move to, to New York, somebody having the ability to buy that property in New York. That's a very small pool of people. Whereas Bitcoin, you have a full, the whole world to buy from you. And from the bank's perspective too, just going off that to close things out here, from the bank's perspective, if you think about how many people, how many families have lived off their real estate holdings in cities like New York, they put that up as collateral. They go to the bank and say, hey, I have this building in, in Manhattan. You can, you can have this for collateral. I want some money. I want to go pay for my daughter's wedding. I need some money. So as the bank there, they're thinking, well, yeah, it's pretty pretty bulletproof having land in Manhattan as your collateral. But think about if something were to happen and you couldn't make your payments anymore and the bank had to seize that asset and sell it to try to get their money back out of the deal. That's where that limited market demand comes in. It's going to be very hard to sell an apartment in New York for 5 million bucks when everybody's leaving there. As an example. But if you go to the bank and say, hey, I have a Bitcoin, 
I need some money. The bank's going to love that because if you stop making your payments and they need to flip that asset to cover their losses with you, not only do they not have to decrease their value of the asset because of their limited market, but they can turn it around and sell it that day. They don't have to find a realtor. They don't have to find lawyers. They don't have to get the banks involved. They can take your Bitcoin. They can sell it that day, recoup their money that you owe them and move on. It's going to be the greatest asset for the banks. It's why we call it the greatest asset in history.